At the Edios booth of IBC this year, we can see Matthew Scott demonstrating Edios 8.22. Many of you might be familiar with his tutorials. He has done plenty of them and mainly about color grading and showing fancy new features. So we're happy to, to also get a short demonstration of the new features from you. Live from IBC. Yes, thank you very much, Michael. It's, uh, it's great to be here. I love being here and I love uh, helping the community or just sharing what I'm passionate about about EDS because I'm not selling anything and I'm not trying to show you how you should do things. I just show you how I do things and why I do them and hopefully uh, it's well received. So yeah, um, while I've been here, I've been demonstrating two new features uh, within EDS 8.2. And like you said, a lot of you may already be familiar with them, but maybe you'll learn a thing or two because I'm going to be demonstrating how I use them and how I've been demonstrating them at the show. So should we get into it? Yes. All right. <laughs> now, I will be moving a little bit faster than tutorial speed. Um, but again, you can check the tutorials already online, slow them down. But just to give you an idea of um, sort of what I've, I've been demoing here at IBC. So there's, um, the first thing I just want to get out of the way is um, something that's not necessarily new to EDIUS, but it's definitely very important um, when doing high-end color correction or working with content that um, is one, higher than 8-bit, and uh, two, maybe has raw properties and things like that. So when we're doing high-end color correction, we want to make sure we're working in 10-bit. I've been through this a million times, but let's just show an example between the difference of 8-bit and 10-bit. So currently I'm working in 10-bit, and I'll just, I love showing this because it, it, it really em exemplifies, how do you say that word? It really is a good example of how important it is. So I'm just going to add a curve here. Um, and this is a sort of a typical situation where 8-bit footage will just fall apart very quickly. So if we go full screen here, you can see this beautiful color grade. Um, <laughs> if I change the bit depth to 8-bit color space, um, straight away you can see blocking, um, or what you call banding here. And hopefully you can see that on the camera as well. And what that's just showing us is that once you push the grade too far, which doesn't happen very quickly, I'll, I'll add, um, you start seeing the separation between the 256 shades uh, between black and white and RGB as well. So if we go ahead and just switch that back to 10-bit, instantly things are better. We've got 1,024 shades. So this is really important. Um, and it's especially important when we're going to be using Edis's new primary color correction filter, which is awesome. <laughs> so let's have a look at um, two new filters. One of them is a primary color corrector, which has some really um, some cool stuff in it, not just color correction per se, but um, color management, um, which is really cool. And um, the mask tool, which you're probably already familiar with, but now we can track the mask tool. So I'm going to use both of these sort of combined now. And I like to demonstrate with this clip, maybe you've seen it, some kind of beautiful, it's a movie that I shot in Australia not long ago. And um, shot on the red scarlet, but transcoded into DNxHR. This is 10-bit um, footage. So we have our character walking in the door here. And what I want to do is sort of demonstrate how these tools might be used in a news environment. And then we'll go on to have a look at how they might be used in a more post-production, high-end environment. So my goal here is to uh, blur this guy's face out. Um, but before we do that, let's go ahead and color correct this shot using the primary color corrector tool. And I'm going to explain this a little bit better in a moment, but what I'm going to do is just transform the color space into, from log to an Alexa color space. So we have the footage transformed very, very quickly there. Um, but one thing I notice when that happens is because the Arri Alexa colors were not designed for a red camera. So things like skin tones might look a little bit off. For example, this guy's skin tones are very red magenta. So I'm just going to quickly uh, fix that using a, a common technique that I've taught many times using the three-way color corrector. It's going to allow us to limit the hue, saturation, and luminance um, using what's called a qualifier. So if I click on the color range, click on his skin a few times, and then turn the key on, you can see that I've successfully very quickly created a key uh, based on that color range. And we can just sort of uh, modify that a little bit as well. And now what I can do is I could change the color of his skin. And basically, you don't have to worry if you get, don't get a perfect key, um, because all we're doing is just very gently taking that magenta shift out of his skin. I might just desaturate the midtones a little bit and push a little bit of yellow in there. So that's looking much better. We've transformed the shot with a primary color corrector and we've fixed the skin tones. Next thing I want to do is use the new mask tool. So we'll go ahead and drop the mask tool on there. And uh, we're just going to create a very simple shape around this guy's 
head, and we're going to use this new tracking feature. So traditionally what we would have had to do was add keyframes here and go back in time and animate this mask ourselves, which, as you can see, isn't too difficult, but it's not as accurate or as quick as doing something like this. I just click track forward, and as you can see, Edius is using features from the video clip and it's resizing, repositioning, and rotating the mask to suit uh, what we're trying to track here. So we can go ahead and press stop there. You can see all the tracking information is now stored in these keyframes. And I'm going to track backwards. And sometimes you notice the, uh, the tracker doesn't work perfectly, but we can always go in and just modify that. So I can just shift this over here and shift this over here. So very quick and easy, very um, easy to understand as well. Um, but now the goal might be in a news environment to blur the guy's face out using a mosaic. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. All the news guys love a mosaic. They just love a mosaic. I'm going to uh, soften the edge of the mask. No, but I want, I want to soften it by maybe, yeah, 50 pixels. And, and then maybe sharpen it by a lot more, just to make sure we can see it. There we go. Yeah, so it just brings that extra crispness to the face, um, brings the highlight to the uh, specular highlights in the eyes, and really helps you to connect with what you're supposed to be looking at here. So very subtle effects here, just gently affecting skin tones, gently affecting focus using a mask. Uh, but let's go ahead and do some more drastic uh, color correction. And again, you've probably seen this clip. You can download it from my blog, matscottvisuals.com. Um, so I will just rush through it, but I'm going to show you how we're going to use the new primary color corrector as well to help speed things up a little bit. Um, so there's a couple of goals here. One of them is to de-stretch this anamorphic footage. So I'm going to do that using a Lancost 3 high quality uh, resizing algorithm just to maintain the best possible pixel interpolation when uh, stretching something out. And as you can see, um, this is shot with a Sony F55 and we're looking at S-Log3. So contrast and saturation needs to be changed or fixed. So there's probably uh, you know, many different workflows that people would uh, take with this. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go color correction primary color corrector, which is the new filter. And again, I'm going to use an Alexa uh, LUT. So you'll notice we have all these camera transformation LUTs here. Um, so I could go to a Sony Rec. 709 LUT and transform it that way. But I actually like the Alexa LUT. I like the colors it does. Uh, for skin tones especially, so if we add that... Where, where did you get all these LUTs? Oh yeah, so this one, um, specifically, you can go to Ari's website and you can create your own LUT. And um, you can change like the knee in the LUT and, and what... Yeah, you can, you can download it for free and you can create your own LUT at the Ari website. Um, some of the others, I've just Googled um, creative LUTs and people give them away for free. Some of them are terrible. Um, a couple of them, like this one, I actually purchased, which cost me about $80 US. But it's very, very good, and I'm going to demonstrate that a bit later. Um, so all these ones down here are ones that I've imported. And um, to import a lot, you just click on this little icon up here, and then import using this import button. And when you click that, my USB hard drive out the back has to wake up. There it goes. Um, and we can select a lot and import it that way. So Edius will support 16-bit uh, .cube LUT files, 3D LUT files. So, we have our LUTs here to choose from. I'm going to choose the Arri Alexa LUT. And I'm also just going to mess with the contrast just a little bit, bring up the saturation a little bit, and fix the white balance as well. So looking at my preview monitor, things are looking much better now. So you can see how quick and easy that was, much quicker and easier than uh, my traditional color grading tutorials using the YUV curves through the color corrector. Of course, they are viable techniques, but it's, it's more efficient, more effective to use RGB. Um, so I'll get into this in a moment as well. But we're just going to use a lot for this example. And now we're going to go ahead and change the color of her eyes. So I just want to show you how quick and easy that is, especially with a mask that automatically tracks. So just to show you how well the, the mask tracks, if I add a mask here and just track forward, um, you'll notice that the mask sticks very well to our eye, even though there's uh, raindrops falling down, because it has a lot of features to track. So you really should experiment with the size of the mask that you're tracking and the position of the mask before you start tracking. So if you're not getting good results, try limiting the range the mask looks at or try making it bigger as well. But in this case, we don't need a very specific mask. We just need something very general here as long as we're not including anything outside of her face because the, the idea is to key the blue. So we've got a blue background, blue top and blue eyes. I want to focus my Kia inside of this mask. So let's go ahead and track this. And just as a quick tip, if you turn off your uh, color correction filter before the mask, you'll get a quicker track, because that way the computer doesn't have to process the LUT, process the color correction, and then track. 
um, but we're just not going to do that because it looks better. <laughs> so once we have our tracking data, you can see it's very quick and easy. Then we can go ahead and add a filter on the inside of the mask. And uh, this is one thing I really love about Edius's mask compared to other masks. It's already set up for you to be very quick and, and you know, effective. Like I've got an outside filter and an inside filter and a soft thing. I can do all this very quickly without having to make extra masks for the outside and things like that. Um, so now we have our mask on the inside filter. I'm just going to use the chrominance Kia, which is here. And I'm going to use my eyedropper, turn my key on and click on her eye. Now you'll notice if I click her skin, I've created a key based on the colors and luminance and saturation of her skin. But if I click on her eye, I'm limiting the color range to more blues. But you can see that the eyedropper hasn't worked very well. So we can always go to the color luminance tab and look at the chroma range and just decrease the range until we get a nicer key. So now we have a much nicer key and the beauty of the chrominance filter is we can blur that key as well. So I could probably get a better key than this, but let's just leave that for now. Turn the key off, go ahead and add a three-way color corrector. Now when doing things like eyes and brightening up or relighting someone's face, I always jump straight for the mid-tone contrast slider and just take away some contrast and that way you're sort of brightening things up gently. It's a little bit easier than using a curve. And then I'm just going to drag sort of like a twilight orangey green into her eye. Go ahead and press OK. And you can see the result here. If I just duplicate this layer and delete those filters, uh, yeah, we've got a great effect here using very simple tools in EDIUS, um, but very powerful tools. So when talking about the power of RGB processing, um, as you guys probably know already, um, EDIUS works in a YUV color space. And at least we get to work in 10-bit, and I'll show you the importance of that. But now that we get to process things in RGB, we can use things like LUTs because an RGB is a very precise measurement where YUV has lots of calculations in it. RGB is more direct. So what happens when you drag a clip to the timeline in EDIUS, it's instantly being processed in YUV. As soon as we go ahead and add our primary color corrector, it's all of a sudden being interrupted by this RGB debayer and we're not even looking at YUV anymore. We are here, but on our output, we can look at RGB if we like, depending on the output card. But the point is the processing is happening in RGB. So why is that good? Well, one, for precision, so we can start using LUTs and things like that. But two, remember we used to color, well, remember I used to demonstrate coloring with a YUV curve. And let me just quickly rehash that here. So we get the YUV curve. If we look at our scopes here, and we go ahead and adjust some contrast, You'll notice it doesn't matter what I do with this curve, my color does not change. So what that meant was, although this can be useful sometimes, just affecting the luminance only, often I want to increase saturation and, and do some saturation tweaks as well, which is another step. So I'd have to adjust my contrast here, and then go ahead and go effect, three-way color corrector, and you know me, I love adjusting saturation in the mid-tones, but now that we have the RGB curve, I find myself not using those filters anymore. Because if with the RGB curve, we turn our scopes on. And we go ahead and play with a similar curve. You'll notice what happens when I add contrast, I'm also increasing saturation. So this is really important. Um, and it's just the way an RGB curve works because basically you're playing with the strength of the brightness of each channel RGB, which in turn changes the luminance as well. So it's a little bit different to how YUV works. But as you can see, it's easier, and I think it looks better as well. I'm not exactly sure why. I don't know this, why it looks better, but I've done a lot of um, comparisons between YUV plus saturation and RGB, and it just looks better. I don't know what it is, um, so it's good. Maybe it's because it's being debayed in RGB first. So as you can see in this shot, it's looking much better, and boy, does it look beautiful because I shot it. Um, but it looks much better now that I'm color grading it as well. But instead of doing your own curve, um, now what I'm going to do is use a film emulation LUT. So you probably already know what a LUT is. It's a lookup table. We used an Arri Alexa one before. But this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a film emulation LUT. So I just downloaded these off the internet. Easy to find. Just type Google Kodak film emulation LUT. They're everywhere. They're for free. You'll find them in DaVinci Resolve as well. So I'm going to use this one here, the Kodak 2393. Go ahead and click OK. Now you'll notice with LUTs, uh, they can be a bit fiddly sometimes because they expect two things, perfect exposure and perfect white balance. And even me, I don't get perfect exposure and perfect white balance. So we need to correct that, right? Um, and we could, we could correct it literally just with the exposure tab, but I find that sometimes I start clipping highlights that way and I don't get the true control that I want. 
But what you will notice is if you do use this curve, if you do, sorry, use this exposure slider, then what you're doing is you're maintaining the curve that's built into this LUT. So this specific Kodak LUT already has a curve in it, and it's, it's very specific. It's specific, it's supposed to emulate something. So as soon as I start playing with this curve, I'm changing the original LUT curve. So keep that in mind. If you don't want to change the original LUT curve, use the exposure slider. But it's me, so I always want to make it my own. Let's go ahead and change the curve. And this way I get to monitor my shadows and my highlights and create a look that I want. Now along with that I said the exposure is one thing, but also white balance is another one. So I'm going to adjust saturation here and I'm going to bring the color temperature back a little bit just to cool this scene off. But look how beautiful this is. I'm so easy to do, so quick to do. Plus we get to use LUTs. Everyone loves using LUTs and now we can do that in EDIUS, so, so cool. Let's have a look at just enhancing this scene a little bit more. So I'm going to go effect and you guessed it, we're going to use the mask, but we're not going to track anything this time. I'll just zoom out here, reposition this over here, grab my mask, and I'm just going to draw a very simple shape, something that's going to emulate the light coming into the room. And I'm going to soften it by 1500 pixels. And I'm going to add filters on both the inside and the outside of that mask. So on the inside, I'm going to add a combined filter because I need more than one. And one of them, again, is going to be sharpness. I always like to draw focus to what you're supposed to be looking at. We can sharpen this quite a lot. Keep in mind that when you're working in Ultra HD, um, the sharpening effect has less effect when you're working in HD because this is a pixel measurement. So when you're in Ultra HD, you can sharpen it a lot more before you start seeing artifacts. So I'm going to go all the way up to 40. And as you can see on the 4K monitor there, it looks really, really nice. There's no point sharpening everything in the frame. You just want to sharpen what you want people to look at, right? Um, so what else are we going to do in there? I still use the YUV curve sometimes, so let's go ahead and grab the Luma channel there and just bring it up a little bit, making sure we don't make it too hazy. So I just grab my black point, bring it back down. And if we just have a look at before and after there, you can see the subtle effect that that has done. And then on the outside filter, I'm just going to use a three-way color corrector and just gently bring down the midtones and the shadows and desaturate the shadows as well. Go ahead and press OK, press OK. And look at what that mask has done. It's subtle, but it's helping you take your focus off the bottom left-hand corner and bring your focus more into the center of the frame. We can always go back and emphasize that even more, go back to the YUV curve, and just bring up that brightness even more. And you can see the difference there. Now we could go ahead and you know add another mask here and maybe just track and relight his face. Very simple to do, just add the mask there and start tracking forward. Now again, what we're doing now is we're processing a primary color corrector with a lot, a mask shaft of light with sharpness, so our tracking is happening much slower. So if we go ahead and abort that, turn our filters off, uh, we're going to get much faster tracking as you can see there. So just a little tip when using the tracking tool. So that should do now just for this demonstration. We'll turn our filters back on. And even though we've already sharpened it by a hell of a lot, I'm going to go ahead and sharpen it even more. So we'll just finish off this demo uh, with one more example here. Um, but you can see the before and after. Things are looking very nice. We've got this beautiful filmic look. And um, thanks to the LUT, our color uh, transform was done for us. Now speaking of color transform, let's have a look at this scene. Um, the movie that um, this content is from is called The Resurgence, a fan-made Pokemon film, so look out for that. Shot that in Melbourne recently, got to plug that for Revolving Door Productions. <laughs> um, but let's go ahead and add a primary color corrector here. And um, we've been talking about the curve, we've been talking about LUTs, but white balance is also so much easier now with this white balance slider. So it almost makes the white balance uh, picker in the three-way color corrector redundant because it is just so much easier, especially because we can fix magenta and green tint as well. So let's go ahead and first of all add a LUT. Now this time we're going to add that LUT I was talking about that cost me 80 bucks. Um, it's a Kino 34 LUT, which is basically emulating Michael Bay's classic teal and orange look. It's way over the top, it's distasteful, but everyone loves it. So let's go ahead and apply that LUT. Now, like I said before, if your, shot, if your footage is not perfectly exposed with perfect white balance, the LUT's going to look terrible. So we need to fix the white balance and we need to fix the exposure. And you know what? I'm not happy with this curve. It needs more contrast. So let's bring up the contrast a little bit and let's back off the saturation a little bit. 
But look at what this LUT is doing. It's so cool. Look at the skin tone separation. The skin has become this extreme copper color and we still have pure whites, but we have this teal. When anything's like gray, it turns teal. This is the teal orange look. And you can control how much teal we're looking at or how much the LUT is playing with that separation just by adjusting the white balance. So the more warm you go, the less teal you get, and the cooler you go, the more teal you get. So somewhere in between, which is a perfect white balance, things are looking pretty good. Now, just to finish off the demo now, uh, we'll just quickly talk about HDR, because uh, this is the new buzzword at IBC, and um, this is the new 4K. And 4K wasn't that exciting, but HDR is exciting. I'm really excited about HDR. Because what it means is that for years we've been stuck in this tiny little gamma space where we only have a limited range of colors and a limited range of brightness. And that's not just a software thing, it's a hardware thing. So the TVs that you buy are all limited in this range. So it doesn't matter if we're shooting raw 16-bit, grading in 10-bit. At the end of the day, we're missing out on so much. So um, now, uh, thanks to Atomos, we have this little monitor here that I can demonstrate, which you may not be able to see on the camera, but I urge you, if you ever get to sit in front of a real HDR monitor and see the difference, it is amazing. You're going to have to take my expressive face um, <laughs> for real because it seriously is. So how do we grade uh, HDR in EDIUS? Well, currently there's no official workflow for HDR because there's a lot of things that are still being implemented and a lot of standards that are still being standardized. And one of them is like the monitor itself. Uh, monitors um, are measured in brightness, How what's the brightest thing they can show. And normal TVs have a maximum brightness, I think, of 100 nits. And um, HDR televisions can go all the way up to 10,000 nits. But currently on the floor, you'll have a range between 1,000 nits, 4,000 nits, 5,000 nits. So which one is it? How do you grade for which TV? This is what I mean. It's not standardized just yet. But the point is, it's way brighter. <laughs> so not only do we have a, a maximum brightness increase, we also have a color gamut that is so much bigger than before. So take this, for example. My phone represents the color, current color gamut. And this mouse pad represents a new color gamut. So much, much bigger, way more range of richness and saturation. And um, so now what I'm going to do is uh, just go to my primary color corrector, right? Make sure our source is in a BT2020 color space. Because if you have a look here on our scopes, uh, we're working in a BT709 or Rec709. This is the color space I was talking about. This is the gamut space that we're restricted to for so many years. But now in BT2020, obviously, We've maximized that, excuse me. Just uh, burping up my hot dog from outside. I had this truffle hot dog, so delicious. <laughs> anyway, so BT 2020. So as you can see, this color correction tool um, is very useful for, for creative reasons and very powerful because it's processing in RGB 10 bit. But it's also a color management tool. So as I talk about HDR workflows and Eddie is supporting it, I wouldn't really call this a super refined workflow, but um, at least we can do it. And what I'm saying is that I'm managing my project's color through this filter. But eventually, uh, what we're going to be seeing is in project settings, maybe we'll have a drop down here which says um, SDR, HDR, and maybe you get to even choose the brightness of the nits of the television, something like that. So it's all going to be much easier to work with eventually. Um, but just for now, let me demonstrate using the primary color corrector. As long as our BT2020 is in action, um, and maybe I'll choose BT2020 for my output as well. Then what we can do is we can start grading in HDR. So it's going to look terrible here. We can't trust these anymore. This looks crap, this looks crap, but this little guy looks awesome. So what we need to do is actually change our monitor to show Atom HDR. So this is Atom Moss's interpretation of HDR using their own curve. And uh, that's their proprietary thing at the moment. And it at least gives us an idea of what HDR could look like especially since it gives us a, an indication of how many stops more we have access to. So if I slide this slide all the way to the left, we have 100% uh, Rec. 709, which is this current clamped color space, brightness range. If I slide it somewhere in the middle, now I'm having access to an extra four stops of dynamic range outside of that space. So this is what's exciting. Now, if I turn all this uh, screen information off, the image looks dark. But look how much range we have here. I'm going to play with my curve, my RGB curve. And uh, you can see here, just the, not only the, the, the contrast is just phenomenal, but the saturation. There's something about HDR saturation. And it's because of that huge color gamut. When you increase saturation to like something crazy like that, 
Yeah, it looks distasteful. And let me fix the white balance so it actually looks a little bit better. Yes, like you would never increase saturation that much. But maybe you would if it was like some cartoon movie about the Snow White or something. But the point is, in Rec. 709, that amount of saturation looks terrible. Like it looks like a mistake. In BT 2020, Rec. 2020, it kind of looks cool. Like there's just something magical about the colors and the brightness. So just quickly, what I've done is just scrub through to the end of this frame. Um, because there's a beautiful contrast ratio happening here. We have streaks of light coming in through here. And for those who are interested, that's a 2K blondie outside shining through some slats of wood. I got some overhead soft boxes with tungsten balanced light and an LED in the fridge. So you can see your yeah, contrast is beautiful. The set design's wonderful. Looks terrible over here, but in HDR, watch this. I mean, I'm going to set my destination light to that Kino Hollywood look. And look at this, man. It just, it just looks so awesome. Look. The light shining on that wall almost is like, it's like lighting my face. This is just a whole new world and it's so awesome. Just back off saturation, make it a little bit more tasteful. You can see the difference here, like what you can do in HDR is just, it's so exciting. And I don't even know like what's going to happen. When I start grading HDR, it's going to be sick. I just can't wait. I can't wait because I like learning new things as well and having the ability to do something I've never done before. And this is what's great about EDIUS. Like, it's an affordable product, but it's so powerful. So I'm just happy to get it out there and start talking about it enthusiastically because this, this, is, this is awesome. I think there's one thing which is also interesting about powerful because uh, now we have GPU support for uh, this yes. filter. So, I mean, it's, uh, it looks like it's your most popular filter now, right? Yes. So you use it every time on every clip. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. So where should this GPU power help ah, yes. on this clip? That's a good question. <laughs> Um, so if you're already familiar with EDIUS, you'll know that EDIUS doesn't really utilize the GPU because it doesn't need to. Um, but when we're processing in RGB, it is a much more processor intensive uh, correction. So we, we can actually change the settings to make sure that the, uh, the new filter does use the GPU. Oh, wait a second. It already does use the GPU automatically. Yeah, so this filter automatically will access your GPU. But um, sort of this is a segue into uh, raw support for EDIUS as well because um, if I just have a look here in my raw clips I've got some red footage here so you can see red video 4096 by 1708 I got some Sony raw footage here as well um, but the point is you can go to the settings system settings importer exporter and you can say hey when I import Sony raw make sure you debayer it using the GPU and you can select which GPU you have um, and that's really powerful as well so EDIUS is now always the king of speed and, and no rendering using CPU, but now we're leveraging GPU as well for like RGB processing and raw debayering and things like that. So yeah. yeah. I think the GPU cannot help so much when you're working in YoW, mm. but now with processing more RGB and raw, uh, the GPU can be useful and it's, it's fine to see that it's there now. Yeah, and you probably use it a lot. I do, yeah. <laughs> yeah, especially since GPU is becoming much more affordable. Yeah. I bought um, an 8 gigabyte Radeon R390, it was like $499. That's amazing. And I can use that in EDIUS. So, yeah, that's, yeah, this is all exciting stuff. Very exciting stuff. So, hopefully, you got some um, use out of that. Remember, a lot of those LUTs you can just find online. You can modify the LUTs. You can create your own LUTs in Photoshop. So, yeah, I mean, all this stuff just opened EDIUS into a new world. <laughs> so, thanks, Michael. Yeah. Matt, thank you so much for your demonstration and all the tips and hints and tricks. And uh, yeah, I, I guess many users will have uh, some, some time now with the ideas to try out and find fancy things as you have found them. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks again. Cheers. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, were you going to fist bump me there? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and high five.